You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. Hey guys, you're listening to episode 119 of The Modern Acre. So Ty, how's the uh, the baby countdown going? Are you going on quite a few little late night ice cream runs? No, not with uh, not with shelter in place. Not as much. There's not really a, a great yogurt place close. But I'll tell you what we are doing. We are ordering ice cream through DoorDash on a fairly consistent basis, maybe once or twice a week. We actually did that last weekend. We got takeout and then we were sitting around watching a movie and realized we didn't have any dessert and we broke down and went DoorDash twice in one night. It was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> We've done that a few times, but it's n- you do not want to end up in that place where you, you have an awesome dinner, you're feeling good, and you have no dessert. That's a terrible feeling. It was quite the walk of shame in the morning when I walked down the stairs and looked at the the cold stone packaging, felt really bad about myself. Yeah, that's okay. Well, Tim, you've got some news of your own celebrating a birthday. Um, you, you are, I mean, are you 50 yet? I mean, I, it's hard to keep, keep track. How old are you? <laughs> just, uh, just hit 33 Ty. So unfortunately I'm, I'm not qualified for the, any of the 30 under 30 lists. So maybe the, the 40 under 40 lists of, uh, are in store for me in the next couple of years, but definitely feeling a little bit old. We've got to get some sort of online petition to get Tim on some some sort of forty under forty list. Like he'll take he'll take whatever he can get at this thirty four thirty four under thirty four. Yeah. So if you guys know any lists, we're trying to get Tim on a list. I'm starting the petition now. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. Um, well, happy birthday, Tim. You made it another year. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Oh, thanks for the warm and fuzzies, Ty. Feeling really special over here. I do what I can. Well, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We really appreciate you listening. And we have a super fun episode today. We we talked about it a little bit on the on the show last week. But this week, we are interviewing Jeff Dunn, who is the chief executive officer of Bolt House and also self-proclaimed chief carrot officer. Yeah, it was super fun talking to Jeff. He has an amazing background in consumer packaged goods and really was one of the pioneers in building the Bolt House Farms brand, eventually selling it off to the Campbell's Food Company and then buying it back. So it's a really interesting story. He's got a really visionary mind just talking about the R&D and innovation that they do at the company. Um, they've been at, at the forefront of a lot of trends in the consumer packaged goods space, whether that's bottled juices, getting into um, health and wellness trends like the keto diet, and also branching into products like CBD. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's always fun to get food companies on the podcast to learn how they're thinking about consumer demand because they're really on the forefront of, of trends and what's happening. So it's always good to kind of pick their brain about how they're thinking about the industry and get their perspective. So without further ado, this is a really fun interview with Jeff. Let's jump in. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Good to be here. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, we're super excited to to talk with you and learn more about what you're up to. Uh, why don't you share a little bit more about your your perspective on the food system and how how this industry has really been evolving? Yeah, so you know it's an interesting time. Obviously, you know with the current reality of COVID, everyone's very focused on that. But if you kind of get above that for a second, I'm sure we'll come back and talk more about that. What's really happened in the last 10 years, a fundamental shift, I think, on a global basis in in people's attitudes towards food. Maybe it's because of Food Channel. Who knows why? But people are much more interested in their food, what it does to them, you know, as part of a healthy lifestyle. And and then importantly, where the food comes from, you know, how are the the people treated who grow their food? And then overlaying all of that is what I think is probably the most exciting aspect of this. There's been a huge investment in early stage technology around food and ag in the last 10 years, ag tech, food tech. That's translated into, you know, some big successes, people, you know, follow Impossible and and beyond. 
those are, are two big ones. But underneath that, a whole set of new technologies on the ag side and the food side that I think will be incredibly important as we think about how to evolve the food system going in the future. So I think it's an incredible time to be in the food business. Uh, obviously, some short-term challenges, but in the long term, um, I think it's uh, technology is about to change pretty much everything about how we think about food and the food supply chain. Yeah, we're super excited to kind of dig into what technology specifically you're utilizing at Bold House. But before we do, we'd love to kind of bring it back to your background and maybe talk to us a little bit about where you grew up and some of your early career that led you into agriculture. You bet. So uh, I didn't start in ag. I didn't grow up on a farm like you guys did. I actually grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, my father worked for the Coca-Cola company. So I grew up uh, around around Coca-Cola and brands, which was probably uh, er- early, very um you know, important in my development, as I say to people, as other people sat around the dinner table and talked about uh, baseball, I talked about brand plans with my father. So I was early, you know, exposed to that. And, you know, when I got out of college, I actually ended up going to work for Coke in their wine business first and then in the soft drink side. So about 20 years at Coke and early stage of my career really taught me about global brands. I ran sales and marketing in the U.S., was president of the U.S. and then president of the Americas. So a pretty broad experience in the first half of my career, really around CPG food and, and beverage brands, which is incredible. And then the, the second kind of 20 years of my career has really been private equity, um, advising private equity funds. I launched my own venture food and ag tech venture fund called Acre Venture Partners. But the you know biggest uh, deal was really running LBOs, uh, and the biggest of which was Bolt House Farms, you know, a family uh, farming business that was bought by Madison Dearborn Partners. Uh, private equity fund. They brought me in to run it. And uh, I ran that business for about uh, four years for them. And then we sold it to Campbell Soup Company. I worked for them for a few years post the acquisition and then left. And then uh, about a year ago, Campbell decided to sell that business. And so I put the team and the uh, financing together to go back and buy it back. So I'm running uh, Bolt House Farms today. So I've had this interesting career between kind of half first half of the career, corporate life, big global brands, second half agriculture and investing around food and ag tech. And, and, you know, what that's shown me is that the integration or the reintegration of the food system is really happening because people, as we said at the beginning, are interested in where their food comes from. Now brands are trying to reintegrate their supply chains, not just use, you know, commodities that, They don't actually know where they come from because people want to trace their food all the way back to the source. So most house farms are kind of a unique business in the sense that we're vertically integrated. Um, Farming business, we're the second largest carrot grower processor in uh, the United States, but we also have a CPG beverage business. So we kind of reflect the two sides of my experience to this point in my career. So I'll stop there, but that's a little bit of my background on how I got to both house farms. No, it's such an incredible story and, and just cool to to see your background and how you really leveraged your experience to lead you to Bold House. So I, I think we can take this in a few f- phases. I'd love to learn about the initial involvement with Bold House and for you to you know come to this family farm and see the vision and invest in the, and then run that business. Maybe Maybe talk about um, when you when you initially got on board with Bolt House, how you approached the strategy of growing the business? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, that's almost ten years ago when I took over uh, the family. Uh, you know, had been running the business all the way up through the sale to Madison Dearborn. In fact, the chairman was a family member who transitioned the business to me. And so when I got there, you know, very big uh, integrated farming operation on the carrot side. Uh, growing about 65,000 acres, large million square foot processing plant in uh, Bakersfield. So, big, and then regional farms in Eastern Washington, Canada, and and Georgia. So their farming footprint was already there. They had uh, because of the nature of growing carrots, uh, because you've got processed carrots like baby carrots, you know, value added carrots, and then you have commodity carrots. So the secret in the carrot business is people buy these value-added, ready-to-eat carrots. They have better margins than just selling commodity carrots. And so that business was very profitable, already scaled up when I got there. But they had launched a juice business on top, starting with, strangely enough, carrot juice, and had gotten that business up to a certain point. But the opportunity and what 
the thesis was for Madison Dearborn when they bought the business is on top of this agricultural business, you could build a vertically integrated juice smoothie uh, beverage business. And that's exactly what we did. We took that business, um, you know, in the, in the four years before the sale, you know, tripled the size of that business. Uh, we, we went from number three in the kind of smooth and, uh, smoothie and juice business competing with Naked and Adwala and other kind of premium brands like that uh, to number one. And we did that through kind of constant innovation. We were vertically integrated. So we were also the kind of entry price point in the super premium category. Uh, so we were in the right place. And we had taken, we took this business through the 2008-9 downturn. But because we were at the kind of value end of the super premium category, there was a lot of secular growth going into these better for you beverages. We showed, I think, eight years of double digit growth in that business. Uh, so really successful. And the innovation uh, which is a bit of why we bought Bolt House back. The innovation was very strong. We went from really a few juice and smoothie flavors to today we have almost 40 flavors, but we launched a, a protein and high protein line eight years ago. It was very successful. We expanded the beverage portfolio into a lot of functional kind of subspaces. And all of that, you know, grew that business. So, you know, today that business, $300 million business. And Campbell's bought, you know, the business, I think because they really preferred that CPG business, the agricultural side was, uh, you know, something that, again, like many big food companies, they had disintermediated historically. Now, this was vertically integrated, so you had all the farming risks. So when I got to Bolt House, the biggest thing I had to learn was really the volatility uh, of farming, uh, being a CPG guy you're used to being able to control your inputs a little more. And so the volatility and the variability of farming and the fact that it takes six months to grow a carrot, about two months to prepare the soil. So you've got to basically plan how many acres you're going to need to support your demand nine months out constantly. And as you know, you're planting and harvesting carrots. We grow and harvest in California all year round. So that volatility combined with the constant nature of kind of planning where, you know, how many acres you need and then seeing the normal variability you get as a farming company, uh, you know, that was, um, let's just say humbling. Um, you know, in, in the Coke world, you, di you had disintermediated most of that volatility. So you didn't get that kind of input cost variability through the course of a year. And in the bolt house business, just the nature of farming is it's a lot more volatile. And that was the biggest thing I had to learn early in those first few years was how to, you know, you weren't going to reduce that volatility. Maybe over time you could, but the fact is you learned to just kind of ride that wave. And when you were long, you know, and the demand wasn't in the market, you create byproducts. When you're short and the demand is in the market, you, you know, you go into higher value added packages, things like that. But, you know, that was the number one thing I learned going into Bolt's house was, you could not control as many variables as you did in the traditional CPG business. That's what makes it to me so compelling and interesting. And by the way, if you want vertical integration, you've got to take the volatility that comes with farms. So that was a long winded answer to your question, but that's kind of what I found when I got there. Yeah, I think that's really unique to Bold House, almost having these two very different business models of a consumer packaged goods business on top of an agricultural business that have totally different seasonality to them. And wanted to kind of dig in a little bit to the CPG business. You mentioned innovation, and you have been kind of at the forefront of all these consumer trends. You mentioned the protein beverages several years back, and uh, more recently in the past couple of years, Tyler and I saw at Fresh Summit last year, you rolling out the, the keto drinks and the CBD drinks, um, different cold brew varieties. Maybe talk to us about how you think about innovation. Yeah, it's it's great. Look, innovation in this category, particularly, we call it kind of you know refrigerated premium beverages, right? So it's not you know it's gone from being started with juice and then to smoothies and then protein drinks and then kombuchas and you know now there's uh, you know a whole wall of these kind of, of drinks. But the one constant in this category has been constant innovation. If you go back to the beginning of the category, it was really out of wall and naked 25 years ago, something like that. You had orange juice and apple juice and grape juice, basically. You know what I mean? It was like, and a lot of it was shelf stable or it was kind of like, um, you know, Minute Maid orange juice, right? That you didn't have all of these kind of more exotic juices. And so when Naked and Iwala, you know, built those businesses, we were the third guy in. So we were late. So one of the things we needed to do, aside from having this kind of vertically integrated uh, platform, which allowed us to be lower cost, 
is we had to innovate not to where they'd already gone because they were strong in juice and smoothies, but we, we started with what was coming next and we just felt like protein and we made a big bet on it eight or 10 years ago. And that obviously has been a tremendous growth vehicle for, you know, the brand over time. So when we started thinking about buying both house back now, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, one of the things I knew is we'd have to leapfrog again. They missed kind of kombucha and gut health. Uh, that was probably the, the, the biggest uh, kind of trend that uh, from when I was running the business. And that they grew very quickly, you know, um, kombuchas and, and gut health related drinks. And so what I felt was there was um, two or three spaces that, you know, were on the kind of lead edge that we need to jump over what's happened and kind of go to where the puck was going. One was certainly um, lower sugar. Uh, they had tried some, you know, 50% lower sugar, but that's not what people want. They wanted no sugar. They wanted very, very, you know, one gram of sugar, two grams of sugar. And so we saw keto as a big trend uh, that, you know, really had legs, 5 million hardcore keto users in the United States, but 40 million keto interested. And we've already launched those products and our velocities are very high already because they really serve kind of a classic meal replacement where you don't want sugar, you know, you, you want the healthy fats, which, you know, you're getting, and, and um, you know, so keto is not just for keto, kind of, as I said, hardcore users. The other thing we saw was functionality kind of across the board, but functionality, again, lower sugar, probably more efficient forms. Shots had started to grow very quickly. And, and so we launched Bolts, which are our shot line. They're just getting into the market now. But, you know, things like immunity shots, um, energy, these are all natural products. Each one focuses on and has a kind of carrot juice in it, red, yellow, purple. But then a lot of active ingredients are immunity, ginger, and turmeric. Very high quality. Again, the entry price point. And then the third leg to that stool, we had a, a, a number of other innovations that came out. But we've you know, made a bet, and we've talked about launching our CBD brand, which we will do. Obviously, right now with COVID, it's, it's been a little more difficult. But we've got a brand ready to go, products ready to go. Uh, we're waiting for some of the regulatory noise to clear, but I'm a big believer that that's kind of the next horizon in terms of functionality. And we, we have a, a, a unique brand on that. It won't be on the Bolt House brand. So as we think about, you know, innovation, you have to engineer it into your company. I've run always innovative companies, so I kind of know how to do it. I brought my whole team back with me, including my product development team and marketing team. So they already knew how I think about these things, and they've been very, very fast on the uptake on hitting these trends. And the products, you know, were in the process of being, they had already been sold in. They were in the process of getting into distribution when COVID hit. So we're kind of in a stasis period here where retailers are really focusing just on the core products. But we think that, you know, they'll get these products in over the next couple of months. And uh, we're very excited about all of them. No, it's been impressive to watch. And I think you, you hit on a, a lot of good points there. I love your analogy of going to where the puck is, is going. I think that's, that's super important in that you you see where consumer trends are going and you have the, frankly, the humility to try new things and to really see what customers are interested in and, and really um, vet those trends. So I think it's been, it's been awesome to watch. I think that's a crucial lesson there. But Jeff, would love to dig in a little bit more to this uh, this Campbell's um, acquisition and then and then sale. Um, obviously, kind of an unusual situation there. But would love to hear from your perspective how you navigated that and how you ultimately thought about coming back. And if there's any lessons that you you learned about, you know, what happened with with Campbell's management of Bolt House. Yeah, look, I think the the overarching lesson is Campbell's are incredibly nice people. They're always very kind to me. They were trying to do the right thing. Denise Morrison was her CEO at that point. She understood that the consumer was moving more into fresh, better for you products. You know, you didn't need a crystal ball to know that. Uh, and they needed a platform um, to do it. And so I think their strategic rationale of buying Bolt House was very smart. But because at that the point they bought it, it was still 60-40 ag versus CPG. The carrot business was still 60% of revenue. It was still very much an ag business. And I ran that business for two or three years post-acquisition to continue to grow because I basically kept the same management team. After I left, unfortunately, uh, a lot of my team left and they didn't leave with me. They just ended up leaving the business. Very entrepreneurial people. I don't think it was anything against Campbell's. I just think it was the nature of these kind of acquisitions. And Campbell's put in their own management team. And when they put their own management team, they um, – 
very much tried to change the processes in the business to more replicate how they did things uh, in the rest of their business. And that goes from how they dealt with operating um, SOPs to people and everything else. Well, that's what you do when you buy a business, you integrate it. Um, and in that integration, that new management team uh, did not kind of do things the way we historically did them, either on the kind of demand side with, you know, they slowed innovation down. But more importantly, they had a number of issues on the agricultural side. They had put a guy in running the business who did not have an agricultural background and our head of farming left. So as you guys know, farming, you got to know what you're doing. And so they had a lot of P&L problems. The top line eroded from a CPG standpoint because they didn't have as much innovation. And then they had real margin problems in the carrot business. And then they had a management change. So I think the lesson is really people matter. And not just generic people, you know, specific people. You, you know, every business is different. And I will tell you that well, Bolt House Farms is a food business, but it's as much an ag business as a processed food business. And if you don't have that deep experience with it and you don't have a deep team, I'm only as good as my team. And so one of the secrets to me buying Bolt House back, uh, I, I syndicated the money with my partners at Butterfly, it's a private equity fund. But one of the secrets to us buying it back was I've been able to bring back, I think I've hired 78 people, seven, eight, that used to work for me at Bolt House Farms, and they've all come back or came back in the first 100 days after we took over. So I was able to take the business over, but bring back the whole team who understood our way of doing things and very quickly kind of change our processes back to the historic Bolt House way. And that's already translating into kind of a, as you heard, you know, more on-trend products, emerging, um, let's just say, improvement in market position. It takes a little while to turn these things around. But most importantly, our quality, our customer service, you know, our internal metrics are all coming in line. So, again, it really goes back to um, the story of big companies buying entrepreneurial businesses is they tend to work as long as you keep the management team and then integrating them is always daunting. Yeah, it's a super interesting story and good to hear your perspective on it. And really cool you've been able to bring back a majority of the team that you had previously, a good testament to kind of your leadership and the culture that you built at, built at Bold House. Jeff, would love to kind of switch gears here a little bit. Um, at the, the start of the interview, we talked a little bit about technology and would love for you to kind of talk us through the importance of technology at Bold House and kind of what technologies you're exploring on both the farming side and the CPG side. Yeah, look, technology, as I said, we launched, uh, while I was at Camels, we launched a external uh, venture fund uh, called Acre Venture Partners. Uh, we invested really in ag- food and ag tech-related businesses, a little bit of CPG product, but it was really much more about the technology side. We believed and, re- and continue to believe that there are a set of emerging technologies on, on the ag and food tech side that will be really game-changing. So on ag, we're in the midst of uh, assessing a, a number of initiatives in this space, but but I, I bucketed on the ag side in, into probably four or five big buckets, genetics. Uh, so what's happening with CRISPR and the ability to, um, you know, have accelerated, you, you know, um, development of new um, crops and new genetics without going through the cost and the time associated, you know, and this is um, really critical. And CRISPR is an amazing technology, but it's also the data associated with it. So we can find, you know, new um, aspects or traits that can be very quickly uh, brought to bear. So I think there's a tremendous amount of work going on, you know, in the genetics and data front. Uh, Robotics, you know, I think we're we're looking at a whole series of, you know, pretty automated as a farming business, but we're still looking at a whole new set of, you know, between drones and robotics, um, robotic weeding, things like that. Look, labor is going to continue um, wherever you are in North America on the agricultural front to be an issue. You got you got immigration issues, and look, you just got farm. You know, you guys are probably a perfect example. You got farming families where. The, you know, patriarch is aging out and the family doesn't want to necessarily stay in the business. So a lot of sale of farms, but it's also just having enough manual labor. So, you know, I think uh, robotics drones, those kinds of things come into bear in, in a very sig- significant way. And, you know, the, the kind of other areas, we're exploring a lot of them. 
Um, but from an ag standpoint, look, if you think about productivity of land, what we're thinking about our rotations and kind of using data to come up with a whole new way of thinking about both organic and, and conventional rotations to add more nutrients back in the soil because what we're seeing is with mapping, we can start to see what's happening. We can be very, very precise in, precise in agriculture in terms of amendments back into the soil. But ultimately, what we want to be able to do is use natural, you know, rotations that actually, you know, add a lot of that value back and use data to figure out what are those in an optimum, what, you know, sense. And so that's one where I see a lot of leverage in all the innovations, uh, biotech mostly, that have gone into impossible. Uh, some of the new technologies that have gone into beyond what those are creating is a meat and they're also dairy analog products. They will require supply chains, agricultural supply chains, to give them the raw material, whether that's yellow peas for beyond, et cetera. So what we're thinking about is the intersection of can we use data to figure out the optimum rotations? Can we use those rotations to focus on commodities that can help us with plant-based products? Because I think the biggest thing in the next 10 years will be innovation around um, kind of a whole new set of plant-based analog products, which over the next 10 years, they replicate uh, meat and dairy today, but I think they can even get better than meat and dairy is this today, much more efficient. And then also ultimately bringing in kind of um, personalized nutrition as we take more personal information, we can start to tailor our diet and then really understand how we can bring kind of plant-based solutions to people that I think can be very healthy. And look, there's a lot of work here in terms of the role of diet in wellness. And, um, you know, unfortunately, meat and dairy just aren't that good for you. So, you know, I think we've got, uh, you know, when you think the vertical integration, you start to think about growing plants, specialty crops, processing and converting those into high value inputs with high nutritional density, and then put those into products that people can understand and fit their cultural kind of requirements. That's where I think the food system is going. That was a super helpful overview, Jeff. I, I think it's it's just awesome to hear how you're thinking about things and how you guys are really thinking about technology and the trends in that space. And I definitely agree with a lot of the points that you hit on. As, as we wrap up this section, we'd love to hear about your focus over the next 12 months for the business. A year from now, what does success look like for you? Well, that answer is different today than it would have been six weeks ago, because six weeks ago, I would have talked about launching a lot of new products and plant-based products and CBD product, et cetera. I think, unfortunately, with COVID, that, you know, we've had to call the business back in the short term, last six, eight, six, eight weeks, to really only focus on two things, which are employee health and safety, because in this environment, you know, in food plants, that's the most important thing to protect my people, but also if I want them coming to work, we've got to create a safe environment. We're hearing a lot about this, you know, out in the media today. So, you know, we focused on that and then we focused on basic, uh, most important word, basic business uh, continuity, um, you know, because we got to get people fed. And so particularly on the carrot side, but a little bit on the juice side as well. So we've been very focused on reengineering our whole business around those two objectives. And so, you know, the answer to your question is 12 months from now, success looks like one, I've got a healthy organization that my, uh, you know, operations are, are up and running. And hopefully we're coming out the other side of this. I think until there's a vaccine or anybody testing, it's going to be very problematic. But, you know, COVID unrelated, I think we've really focused on a couple of things. One is um, expand, continuing to expand our carrot footprint and kind of get back some of the lost um, share and revenue that we had. And then we got a big byproduct business. So we got a lot of kind of core operations work going on in Carrot, really all the way back to the farms, a lot of um, implementation of new technologies to help us with that. But we also have a whole set of Carrot innovations coming, uh, which are really exciting and probably a whole nother podcast. But but we think we can do for Carrot what's happened with cauliflower and some other things. Carrot lends itself to a whole set a really interesting products and, and we, we can show you those at some point, but so big, big opportunity on the carrot innovation front and then beverage, these three spaces I talked about, you know, this, this um, enhanced protein space, um, you know, this functionality space, not just with shots, but other functional drinks and then our CBD product, 
you know, again, 12 months from now in a normalized way, all of those things would be in the market. I would expect them to be really trending well. Again, early returns where we have got them out are very strong. And then, you know, the last piece is we bought this business, you know, I believe in innovation driven growth. We bought this business to kind of put it back in its leadership place and in kind of this part of, uh, you know, the food chain. And so we also see a huge opportunity to scale this business up over time through acquisition. We've got a deep management team. It's an incredible platform. And if you think about this plant-based world that I think we're moving towards, scale companies, I mean, again, you guys grew up on a farm. We have 185 family farms that we buy carrots from, and then we got a lot of our own land and we grow it on. Um, all of them have the same kind of um, narrative for us, which is, look, they want to maximize the health of their land. They want to maximize, you know, their farm incomes. They want a sustainable future, you know, for their families and for the farm. And so a lot of this is, can we help our farming partners get even healthier? Because, you know, it's very difficult in farming now. And, uh, and so how can we bring technologies, bring new markets, new products potentially in, into our farming partners? Because I tell you what, it's, um, it's critically important and it's hard work. And, and I think people are appreciating it a little more now. You know, the people grow your food, move your food, stock the shelves. And I think we all should because that's you know, our food system is holding up. And it's holding up because we have a lot of incredible people working really, really hard and really hard jobs. Yeah, I think in the in the near term, you're definitely focusing on the right things. And as we get through uh, through the COVID situation, looking forward to seeing your innovation come through. And on the on the carrot front, looking forward to some carrot crust pizza, pizza perhaps. Yeah, there you go, man. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, you know, look, it's I, I have a simple thought about this. Like, and I I don't get on people for eating meat. I I, I have friends who have farms and you know, I eat meat once in a while with them and we'll slaughter animals. It's like, uh, if you're going to do it, you kind of got to do it right. And, you know, have an understanding of the whole process. The problem is when you disconnect people from all that and, and it's just kind of um, unconscious consumption, uh, I think people overconsume, and, and there's real environmental cost on, on all of that. And so I think people are kind of getting wise to the game, you, you know, and look, we're going to feed 8 billion going to 10 billion people. We will need to grow different things in different ways, turn them into more nutritious products with more nutritional density. And as a farmer, one of the metrics we're starting to talk about is nutritional density per acre. You know, for every acre of land, what do you get out of that land in terms of, of kind of a balanced uh, set of, of nutrition? And look, it's not like every acre is going to be different, but it is a way to start to measure, are we growing using a lot of acres for some commodities that maybe don't have the, the right kind of health uh, profile to them, either for the planet or, or for consumers? And I think we're going to have to reimagine all that in, in this new future. And I, COVID is just going to make it um, more intense, I think, relative to our ability to, you know, it's like the Rolling Stones have a great, you know, song, you know, you don't always get what you want. You get what you need, and and I think we got to start having a conversation about what we really need, not just what we want. Yeah, that's a really good concept. Well, Jeff, this has been a ton of fun. We really appreciate you coming on the show. And as we wrap up here, how can listeners get in touch with you and connect with Bolt House? Well, Bolt House, all of our URLs, bolthouse.com. But uh, you know, we're on everything. You know, Insta, Facebook, all of it. And I'm on there, Chief Carrot. So if you want to find me, you can find me under Chief Carrot. <laughs> that's awesome thanks so much for being on jeff appreciate it all right guys thanks a lot appreciate it so tim what'd you think oh super fun episode with with jeff really enjoyed talking to him um it's really come full circle we we walked by the bolt house booth at pma fresh summit last fall and talked to a few people on their team and it was just kind of amazing to see the range of products that they have um at their core they're a carrot farming company but they've branched into so many different areas and really diversified the business um which i think is what just really focused on and really is legacy for the company is just how far they've grown and become become a consumer packaged goods company not just a commodity no, super good points. And I, I completely agree. Well, guys, I hope you really enjoyed that episode. That was a fun found, founder story, uh, especially considering the the buyback and and everything everything there. So that was a lot of fun. We appreciate Jeff and the Bold House team for, for making that interview happen. 
Guys, as we as we finish up here, would really appreciate you sharing the word about the Modern Acre. We're continuing to put out interviews and just talk to some really amazing people, and we hope you're enjoying it. And if you are, share it with a friend, share it with a colleague. Uh, we'd really appreciate you just uh, passing along the word of what we're doing at the Modern Acre. 